Hello and welcome to the 10th anniversary of the Festival of Speed here in the glorious Sussex countryside. Now this event is literally absolutely unique. It became a cult event in its very first year and it's hardly surprising because people almost literally fight to come here to see the wonderful vintage of veteran cars. They're in superb condition. You can get right close to them, you can touch them, you can talk to the drivers, you can talk to the mechanics. There is literally nothing else like it. The Formula One cars are always a big hit here at Goodwood. The great thing about this event is that you can get up really close to them, but it's not just the machinery that's accessible, because if you wander around the paddock, chances are you're going to bump into the, one of the guys that drive them as well. Alan, you're back for more. You love this event, don't you? Fantastic. Hey, you were saying about uh, you see the drivers and the cars. From my point of view, I've seen Giacomo Agostini riding his MV Augusta. I've also seen René Arnoud riding uh, the Renault Turbo car, and it's fantastic to see that from my side. And it's also pretty enjoyable to be able to thrash an 800 horsepower car up the hill as well. I saw you driving up earlier, and I thought you were taking it quite steadily, actually. Yeah, I know, and then I stopped around the corner and I switched off the traction control and we did a bit of a start, and the real way it should be done. How many cars? are you driving this weekend? I am going to have driven four and it's quite a spectrum because it's been the, the Formula One car, the current car, the 1902 Paris Vienna car that uh, was in fact I think it was the first race car ever for Renault and it's, it's incredible because it's got a gear lever but the actual sway on the gear lever is longer than my arm so I have to get out the seat to actually change gear. Uh, there's the Porsche that I won them all in 1998 and uh, then finally I'm going to get a chance in a car that I have just adored since uh, Rennie started in 1977 with it. It's great that you actually get so excited about driving these cars. If it's hard not to when you come here, that's the thing. Look, we're all passionate and we're all enthusiasts at heart. That's why we get into it in the first place. And this is the sort of way that you can relive your youth in some respects. Because like I said before with Ago and the MV Augusta, I remember going to Spa uh, to watch a Grand Prix with my mother and father and sitting on top of the pitch looking down to Eau Rouge as it, as it was in those days. And I remember seeing you know, these guys going through it and it was fantastic. And seeing Mick Grant as well. and. I really love it. Now the hill climb is such an integral part of what Goodwood is all about. You're a bit of a specialist because you've been up it so many times. Just talk us through it. It's unique. There's not an easy part. It's all pretty tricky. But uh, I think at the end of it, there's people that come here to drive it, to enjoy the cars as much, to actually go up the, the hill as quickly as possible. But you know what we're all like when you sort of get in a car and you put the visor down, there's only a few things come into your mind and those are fast speed and bright throttle. Uh, you're up at the starting line, you're looking for uh, the little green box to illuminate and that's you off. It's on your left hand side, you drop the clutch, you switch off the TC because it's much more fun. Up first, second, third gear, the trees are zooming past on both sides then it's hard on the brakes through the 90 degree right hander. Just making sure you're clean and tidy through there and then up to the next right hander in front of the house. This one opens out, there's a bit of adverse camber on exit, but up in, through the gearbox under the bridge, fifth, and then into sixth gear before hard on the brakes. Trying to be careful because the road cambers into it and then out of it. There's a second gear, very, very slippy, long left-hand bend before a quick acceleration. Up fourth gear, the, the few bumps, the rear of the car actually lifts off. And then you're down into third gear, round about the wall. I always make sure I'm well away from the wall on the left-hand side. Up to fourth gear and then through the right, little bit of a straight where you go up into fifth, down to fourth, and then a long, long left-hander that opens out just at the final moment before you cross this, the finishing line. And it slow it down, down into first gear, and past the marshals, a little bit of a wave, switch off the traction control again, and have some fun. Well, Alan McNish, as a Renault driver today, loved seeing Rene Arnoux in this Formula One Renault of 25 years ago. The RSO1 was the first turbocharged F1 car of all. 
and it started a whole new trend. Now, bang up to date with Colombian superstar Juan Pablo Montoya in the BMW Williams FW24. Juan Pablo, like the other F1 drivers, just wanted the huge Goodwood crowds to see and hear what a 900 horsepower F1 is all about. And providing a nice BMW contrast, this is the Brabham BMW of 20 years ago, back when the Brabham team was owned and run by one Bernie Eccleston. In qualifying form, its little 1500 turbo engine produced over a thousand horsepower. At the wheel, the man who used it to win the 1983 World Championship, Nelson Piquet. Nelson, is this a bit of a trip down memory lane for you? It is, it is. I drive my car, the, I won the championship 20 years ago. It's a, it's a very good uh, feeling, uh, very good to be here together with all the old mechanics and uh, designers and engineers that I, we worked together for a very long time and, uh, and we've very, been very successful. What did it feel like to get back in the car again? Well, it's a little bit scary. The car is too powerful. <laughs> my action, the car is too quick, my action is too slow, you know. <laughs> But it's, it's for fun, it's good, and it's good too. No celebration of modern Formula One is complete without Ferrari. Here's works test driver Felipe Massa in the F2002, which won 15 out of 17 races for Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello last season. And this year's Jordan Ford EJ13, just like the car with which Giancarlo Fisichella scored a dramatic win in the Brazilian Grand Prix. At the wheel today, this year's new signing, Ralph Furman. Now, testing's been a bit limited for Jordan this year. Does this count as a test session? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. No, we're not trying different setups this weekend. But, uh, you know, it's just a fun weekend to uh, show the crowd. But I've got to be careful. It's my race car for next weekend, so the boys are telling me to take it easy. So you're not even slightly worried about that flint wall that uh, comes up to face you as you turn left up the hill? I'm not. No, I think the guys are on the truck. <laughs> This F1 car was so successful, it was banned after its first race. The Brabham BT46B fan car was designed to suck itself onto the road. Nicky Lauda won the Swedish Grand Prix before the other teams protested it out. John Surtees, world champion on two wheels and four, helped Honda to develop this RA300, with its exhaust system on top of the V12 engine like a nest of snakes. It scored a dramatic win, first time out at Monza in 1967. Two decades later, Honda were powering the McLaren MP45, with which Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost dominated the 1989 season. No love lost between those teammates. After they collided in the Japanese round, the title went to Prost. Today, it's Anthony Davidson at the wheel. Well, that's it for part one, but join us again in a moment for part two, when I'll be explaining what this is and how it's capable of 60 miles an hour. Murray will be catching up with motorcycle legend Mick Doohan, and Louise chats with Juan Pablo Montoya. Welcome back to Goodwood. Now, most cars at the festival come up the hill. But the first law of gravity is what goes up must come down. And these boys take that theory to a new level. This is the Soapbox Challenge. These cars have no engines in them. The maximum weight is 135 kilos, and they only have very rudimentary brakes. Now, the really quick guys will get to the bottom of the hill in just over a minute, maxing out at about 60 miles an hour. One of the most eye-catching entries is ecclesiastical racing. Anthony and Keith here are both vicars and they're taking part in the downhill challenge. Why is the first question, obviously. Well, we saw the carts running last year and we thought this actually would be quite a good way for raising what we uh, are doing with Revelation Racing and that's basically being who we are, which is uh, ministers in the Church of England, but also coming out and doing normal things. You know, 
doing things everyday people do. Like that go down the hill at Goodwill, yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody does that all the time. No, no. We're, we're normal, we have the same passion. You think this same... is normal? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's normal to have a passion about motorsport, isn't it? Right, of and course. That's one is. thing we share, isn't it? Of course it is. Well, you're up against some mm. pretty serious works outfits here. I've seen uh, Bentley entry, mm. Vauxhall, mm. Lotus thing. Mm. Looks like it spent a lifetime in the wind tunnel. What's it like being a privateer against the big guns? Well, in some ways, we think of ourselves as the works entry, um, representing who we do. And uh, it's all part of enjoying ourselves. And, and they've accepted us, and, and we've accepted them. So we'll, we'll do our best, and we'll hope to, to scare them a bit with our speed. So we thought long and hard about certain aspects of the design. I worried for a while about how to make the steering work with no steering column but in true biblical fashion it came to me in a dream really it did it honestly did and, and I put it together and it worked well, although I let Keith drive it I have to say though without wishing to be rude aerodynamically this thing compared to some of the others does look a bit like a Model T Ford yes. compared to an F1 mm. racer but mm. what sort of maximum speed are you going to hit towards 50 yeah. over the mid 40s really yes well very best of luck thank you very much thank, thank you, you. normally leave the Goodwood start line one at a time, but the two Bentleys which scored that magnificent 1-2 in last month's Le Mans 24 hours quite rightly went up together, with Guy Smith in the winning car and David Brabham in the runner-up. All the way up the hill they were greeted with rapturous applause. You can see every time we come up the hill we get such support from the crowd, you can see them all cheering and waving us on and uh, it's almost very similar to how it was at Le Mans after the race so it's great to have the support here and uh, you know the fans seem to really like the Bentley. Now how much has it cha affected your career? Your career was ticking along nicely but this has been massive, is it bigger than you reckoned? Yeah I mean that's right, I mean it hasn't really sunk in, I mean with Le Mans you always hope you'd win it, um, you never really think whether you actually are going to win it but when you actually finally win it it's, uh, it takes some sinking in that's for sure and it's only really now and this weekend that it's starting to, to, to sink in and I've had so many people come up to me congratulating me and, and wish me, wishing me the best for the future and that, you know, that's great and it really starts to sink in about now. There were more Le Mans legends old and new at Goodwood. This Porsche GT1 was reunited with Alan McNish, one of the trio who drove it to victory in the 1998 24 hours. In 1990, the silver cars of the Sauber Mercedes team dominated the World Sports Car Championship. Drivers included the young Michael Schumacher and the veteran Jochen Mass. Out of Crossing Bend and on the straight past Goodwood House, Jochen was using the big V8's mighty horsepower to the full. Until this season, Audi have ruled the Le Mans roost in recent years, and they've also been running with great success in North America. Providing a lot of impetus to that effort has been the irrepressible Johnny Herbert, who's been demonstrating that there is indeed life after Formula One. I've had a lot of fun here. Uh, you know, it's great being able to drive, you know, these cars, and it was fantastic being able to drive uh, Ayrton's car from uh, 93 Donington because it's just so nice to get back into one of those single seaters, I say. Um, <laughs> those Bentley boys, honestly. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we have a little couple down at the bottom, David, yes? Um, but it was, yeah, tea and cakes. Um, <laughs> but it was, no, to get in that type of car again is, uh, is fantastic. You just, can, as a driver, you completely forget what animals they are, and they are fantastic things. And here's a hefty animal, the Toyota-powered Eagle Mark III GTP. It took IMSA racing by storm in 1992 with 17 consecutive wins. The wheel, Juan Manuel Fangio II, nephew of the great five times world champion. Goodwood always attracts lots of famous faces and of course Formula One drivers and one of the visitors here this year is Juan Pablo Montoya. You just can't get enough of this, can you? A weekend <laughs> off and you come and look at racing cars. Yeah, you know, we have to... This is my second time here. I came in uh, 01. And actually when I came in 01, I didn't manage to see too many cars. Today, it took it a bit different. I just, just walked behind everybody and tried to see. And I've seen quite a few cars today. It's been really nice. What's the best thing you've seen? Uh... There's a lot of good things. I don't think there's a one thing that you say. You know, I so saw, I think it's an 88 McLaren in a Senna car. That's really nice. They have the 93 as well. They have, you know, Williams. There's loads of really nice Williams. Uh, especially really old ones. 
you know, the 07s and 08. I saw a couple of them, all Ferraris, and they're really nice bikes. There's an MV Agusta, a six cylinder one. Oh, that sounds beautiful. An enormous crowd here. You must have been mobbed every time you tried to meet up for this enclosure. Yes, that's why, you know, especially when you're with, with, you know, with the security from here. Excuse me, excuse me, coming through. Just like everybody, like, oh. Then I left by myself and just, and it's a lot easier. You know, some people see you, but there's not so much traction, so it's not so bad. But it is nice for the fans to be able to get up close to you. Surely you must appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's you don't see that very often. And it's kind of weird, actually, because you, in F1, the paddock is like this. It's, Uncle. Nobody can get yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Where we're here, you know, you walk by people and people, some, you know, sometimes you walk by people with your hat and t-shirt and they don't even notice you're walking by them with suit and everything. And you're getting behind the wheel as well. What are you driving? I'm driving last year's Williams. I was actually just with Frank and Patrick and I said, I want to drive the old one. I said, oh, you know, the engine's a bit fragile. I said, ah. Oh. Next year. <laughs> well, it's definitely a lot more relaxed than Silverstone, anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's different, you know. You know, this is fun. Silverstone is work, you know, in a way. So, is this fun for you? Yeah, it's alright. It's you know, when you, the first year I didn't enjoy it as much because I couldn't see anything. Where now I said today, and you know, even if people mob me a bit, I prefer to go there and have a good look. This year, the festival has helped the Ford Motor Company celebrate its centenary with an immense sky-high display in front of Goodwood House depicting the Ford Mark IIs that finished 1-2-3 at Le Mans in 1966. The actual trio of cars from that race were there too, and so was the great-grandson of Henry Ford I, Edsel Ford, who had his own memories of Le Mans. I was there in 1966 with my father. He was the Grand Marshal of Le Mans that year, and I remember distinctly what it felt like to come in one, two, and three, and it was, uh, it was wonderful. Now, this is a very important year for the Ford Motor Company as a whole, isn't it? It really has been, and, and it's obviously we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of our company. And what a lot of people really don't know is that, really, we went public in 1956. So, really, for the first half of our, our corporate life, we were owned by my great-grandfather. In the second half, it was a public company. Now, the old saying used to be, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Does Ford's enormous investment over the years of billions of dollars into motorsport, do you think that that sells ordinary, everyday road cars? Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, I, we certainly can look in the United States at our involvement with NASCAR and how much that's meant. I mean, one of the things I like to do typically is go in the car park and look at the vehicles that, that the people drive. At any one given NASCAR race, I'm not sure I can speak for the same over here, but you see Ford pickup trucks and you see Tauruses and you see all of our domestic U.S. cars. So I really believe that the adage is true, that if you win on Sunday, you sell on Monday. Ford won Le Mans four times. In 1969, racing in the blue and orange golf colours of John Wire's JW Automotive team, the victorious car was driven by Belgium's Jackie X and our own Jack Oliver. Well, I'm now of the age, and the cars are, where we're both memorabilia. And uh, when I drove the car in 1969 for JW, you know, duck egg blue with orange stripes, everybody says, what are you doing painting a race car that colour? But as the times come by, you know, the colour has been representative of the GT40 and it really is wonderful to be here to drive it. This is three times world champion Sir Jack Brabham experiencing some Ford horsepower. The AC Cobra started out as an elderly British sports car into which Carroll Shelby stuffed a 4.7 litre Ford V8 engine. The resultant hybrid was good enough to beat Ferrari to win the 1965 World Sports Car Championship and turn the Cobra into one of the all-time collector car classics. And another former world champion, Sir Jackie Stewart, driving the Cologne Capri RS from 1974. All three of Jackie's world titles were powered by Ford. The company was started by Henry Ford winning $25,000 in 1903 on a two-man race in Gross Point, Michigan. Since then, Ford Motor Company have never been out of motorsport. And, you know, when you think of all the controversy that goes on, Ford have been in Formula One since 67 with a Formula One car. 
at the Formula One engine and just doing a great job. And here's the car that put Ford on the map in the first place. The Model T wasn't the first Ford, nor was it quite the world's first mass-produced car. But it had all the ingredients, simplicity, reliability and cheapness. In over two decades it turned millions of Americans, and Europeans too, into motorists. This immaculately restored example belongs to Ford of Britain. It's in the correct black, apart from those lovely white tyres, and that's Edsel Ford in the passenger seat, enjoying the ride. NASCAR racing is all about making a standard-bodied American sedan do 200 miles an hour. In 1969, Chrysler raced the Dodge Charger Daytona, and to comply with the rules, they had to sell them for road use just like this, complete with shovel nose and tall rear wing. Twenty years later, NASCARs look like this, Rusty Wallace's championship-winning Pontiac Grand Prix. The car now forms part of Ron Huber's great collection of historic NASCAR machinery. But if you want a truly barking touring car, what about the 900 horsepower Toyota Tacoma pickup? New Zealander Rob Miller is the one man who knows how to tame it, but it was clearly a big handful storming the narrow, bumpy confines of the Goodwood Hill. The Vauxhall Astra BTCC is a more familiar sight to British race girls. Vauxhall have been pretty much unstoppable in the British Touring Car Championship over the last couple of seasons, with Jason Plato and James Thompson taking the title each. Driving the car today is Mark Tyshurst. Now the BMW M3 GTR with Burkhard Gershel at the wheel. This muscular monster with 460 brake horsepower dominated the American Le Mans series in its debut year. Jerry Marshall, the 500 horsepower Repco powered Vauxhall Baby Bertha, terrorised British circuits 25 years ago and won more than 40 races. And at Goodwood, Jerry showed he's lost none of his charging style. The broad speed modified Jaguar XJ12s ran in the European Touring Car Series in 1977. Showed a lot of speed, but rather less reliability. This one now belongs to Henry Lawson. And here's perhaps the biggest Goodwood crowd pleaser of all, veteran drag racer Bob Riggle and his Plymouth Barracuda. Big back wheels, little skinny front ones, and here's why. Keeping the frantic fish on the tarmac and off the grass is no easy task. And here is that incredible wheeling car in close-up. It's called a Hurst Hemi under glass and its driver is Bob Riggle. Bob, tell us about this extraordinary vehicle. Absolutely. It's a 1966 Plymouth Barracuda. We have a 426 cubic inch Hemi fuel injected in the back seat under the rear bonnet. And basically what we do, we have a three-speed 727 torque flight transmission which goes through a V-drive in the back into the rear end and drives the wheel. And as I get ready to drive, I have a window here that I look out of, and I stab the big throttle pedal here with this being in the gear. Once the car is in the air, this is how I steer it. I pull this handle to go right, or I push the handle to go left. It has a separate brake on each wheel that slows down that side of the car, which leaving me an area to steer in. It's a very exciting ride, and especially here at Goodwood, where you don't have a whole lot of room to work with. And how much horsepower is it? It puts out about 1,200 horsepower. Oh, ho, ho. it's yes. the ultimate muscle car, then. Absolutely, absolutely. And what's the ride like, I mean, from the cockpit? Well, the, the ride is very exciting. I, it's like I like to tell people that it does not do the same thing to you every time. When you go up there, it may go left, it may go right. You don't know what it's going to do. So you have to be really prepared to get on this brake to steer it out of trouble. Well, here we are at the business end of the vehicle. Bob, the first thing you notice, obviously, the engine is sloped forwards. That's presumably so it's level when you're up in the air, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, we carry a 10 quarts of oil in our oil pan, and if we didn't have it at this angle, when the car come up into the air, we'd lose some of the oil, and it would trap it in the back of the heads. wouldn't let it return. This way here, when it comes up, it's just a little past being level at its, at its greatest height, and that way the oil circulation works good. The engine itself, it's a 1968 block, but inside of that, it has a fuel crankshaft, it has aluminum rods, it has Ross pistons, it has stainless steel valves, it has Escandarian roller system as far as the, the camshaft is concerned. So the motor is really overbuilt. It's putting out more power than I really need, 
but it's like having overkill. You don't have to work it that hard, and it does a great job with what you're using. So it works really great. After the break, Murray meets motorcycle legend McDoohan, and we'll be taking a look at the W196 Mercedes Streamliner. paddock where the beautiful people hang out and there are some very beautiful cars here as well. They're all entries in the Stile Lux competition. It's one of the things that really sets Goodwood apart from other motor racing events. The winner will be chosen purely for its aesthetic qualities and there are some very lustrous names on the judging panel. <laughs> so what are you looking for in these cars today? Well we've just been uh, asked to judge in our opinion what's the most beautiful car and um, what we think looks cool but you know it's about the detailing it's about the craftsmanship and um, the thrill of meeting the designers here is seeing how they get inspired by um, shapes from uh, years before it's not a concourse competition in the sense you have to get under the car and look at and make sure all the bolts are the right spec etc it's just what you like um, but even then your first impressions change after you wander around a while, so yeah, it was good fun. What have they told you to look for? They just said go and pick what you I like I think the best. whole idea of having somebody that is not necessarily part of the car industry is just so that there is their own feelings of what brings great style. So, you know, whether I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the Rolls Royces or the Porsches or the kind of slightly um, odd ones over there, I think I'm going to try and, you know, have my taste in there somewhere. It's a tricky one, you know, this judging, because you're supposed to, it's just your favourite. Well, there's a stock car category there. I'm sorry, <laughs> they've all been crashed. I don't know which one I like the most. I just have to do it on colour in the end. And then they wanted me to vote for the best Corvette. It's no such thing. That's like, which leg would you most like to have amputated? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. i tell you what I really like, it's that little Fiat 600 Jolly with the wicker seats. That's a sweet little thing. As always, there was lots of ancient history at Goodwood, like the 1894 Peugeot and the 1902 Renault. The 1920 Layout was sucked along at 60 miles an hour by a five-foot wooden propeller. It carried two passengers in tandem and steered with its rear wheels. Peugeot built this car for what was effectively the world's first motor race, the 1894 Paris to Rouen trial, and it won. This 9-litre Renault single-seater saloon did over 2,500 miles in 24 hours in 1926, a world endurance record. The Napier Railton holds a record for all time. This 24-litre aero-engine monster lapped the old Brooklyn circuit at an average of 143 miles an hour. And the car's now on permanent display in the Brooklyn's museum. In 1923, the Poisin Laboratoire was years ahead of its time, with monocoque chassis, streamlining, and a propeller-driven water pump. The Panard 35 is another record breaker, 130 miles in 60 minutes in 1926, and it won the British Empire Trophy race at Brooklands. Dean Butler's superb straight eight Maserati ran five times in the Indianapolis 500, but had a European Grand Prix career as well. Dean brought another historic Indy car to Goodwood, the Jim Robbins Special, which ran in the 500-mile classic throughout the early 50s. In the cockpit is a more recent American racing hero, the Kentucky kid, Danny Sullivan, 
having a great time sawing away at the special's near horizontal wheel. Motorcycles have their own special place in the Festival of Speed and their own heroes, like five times world champion Mick Doohan, who was riding not one, but two superb Honda superbikes. Mick, you're a legend in your own lifetime, but when you left Australia, did you have the remotest idea of how your life was going to develop? No, not at all. I don't think, uh, you know, everyone has a dream and what what they'd like to achieve and so on when they do leave going to a sport uh, that I guess you've worked all your life at racing to get there and um, you know to achieve one world championship I would have been happy enough that you know I was fortunate enough that I could continue on had a good team around me and uh, was able to maintain a good run but nevertheless you you've raced against and, and beaten people like Kevin Schwantz, uh, Eddie Lawson, Wayne Gardner and a whole, whole lot more. Which was the one that you were worried about most in terms of beating them? Uh, well, they're all tough, but probably Wayne Rainey was... A, Rainey and I, for a couple of years, uh, fought, out the, fought out the title. He, um, he uh, beat me one way or another in, in uh, two of those, uh, two of those uh, championships. Um, uh, I was injured in one of them, and then yeah. there was a, a funny system of point scoring the other year. But still, he was the only guy who was consistent, and that was my uh, my strength also was just being consistent. If I didn't win, I'd be either second or third, and uh, he was the only other guy like that. Kevin Swans had phenomenal speed, but he'd throw it down the road every second yeah. race, you know. Yeah. So he, yeah. he wasn't a championship threat. And uh, Eddie Lawson was also a very strong, consistent runner, but you know. Uh, I guess I came in at the end of his career and he had also changed to a different manufacturer and uh, but I'm saying that I was his teammate in 89 also and uh, he won the world championship so that I was uh, I was struggling to get up to speed in my first year. But there was something very special about you in that you could <clears throat> master bikes that no one else could. Was that determination or application or a bit of both? Well I think a little bit of both, maybe a little bit uh, a little bit the the want to do it you yeah. know and uh, and as you say I've come from Australia all the way over here you know I didn't want to go back yeah. with my uh, tail between my legs either so um, you know I paid the price early on and trying to struggle with some of those things um, but you know that's what you've got to do I think in even today if you if you want to be the best you've got to ride the bike in, in whatever conditions it's presented to you in and, and then try and smoothing out the problems later on. It's great to see you at Goodwood. Is this in fact your first time here? Yeah, no, absolutely. And is it what you expected it to be? It is actually. It's, it's more people than what I expected, crowd-wise and so on. And it's, um, again, the amount of, you know, a lot of these guys here, I've heard the names, but I've never seen the, yeah. seen the faces. Yeah. And so, so it's good to... Stuart Graham, have you met Stuart Graham? I met him today, actually, yes. yeah. So, yes. you know, but not only in the motorcycling side of things, with, with the car racing uh, and so on, there's yeah. a whole bunch of us uh, last night also sitting around talking car races and uh, ex-bike races and so on. So it's basically a, a great field of washed up races, really. So. <laughs> Dan Gurney, one of America's greatest four-wheel racers, now manufactures this remarkable road bike, the 140 mile an hour AAR Alligator, with its foot-forward low-seat riding position and 700cc Honda engine. For Gurney, building the Alligator is the realisation of a dream. And here's one of motorcycle racing's all-time greats, 15 times world champion Giacomo Agostini on a machine from that charismatic Italian outfit MV Agusta. This is a 1972 350cc four-cylinder, like the one that took Ago to the 350 world title in both 1972 and 73. And when he did his last two-wheel race in 1974, it was on a development version of this bike. I'm always happy when I have the possibility to drive my MV Agusta, especially here in Goodwood because I think it's a lot of people, uh, a lot of fun and a uh, nice, nice place. So everybody, I think, happy to come here. Further back in motorcycling history is the 1938 supercharged BMW Type 225, originally written by European champion Georg Meyer. 
1925, this was BMW's competition bike, the R37, with the trademark flat twin engine, of course, and good enough to win the German championship for Franz Biber. Hugely exciting to watch was Trevor Nation on the 100 horsepower rotary powered Norton from 1991. Wheelies all the way on the last British bike to win an Isle of Man TT. Well, the Festival of Speed is celebrating a decade now, and the man behind it, the organiser of the brains, is Lord March. You must be really pleased with the way this thing's grown over the years. Yes, that's got a kind of energy of its own now, I think, but uh, it is amazing how, uh, how it seems to have taken off and people um, you know, kind of enjoy being here. Too. Now, you must be one of the world's most persuasive men because you get Ferrari works team and all the Formula One teams. How on earth do you do it? Well, the F1 teams have been terrific. It doesn't, uh, five hasn't required very much. They're, they're, uh, they've all been wonderfully supportive. Uh, they all seem keen to come and uh, we develop great relations with them and they you know, become great friends and um, they're obviously a big part of the, the whole show. And uh, as far as persuading people around the world, I mean, I think this year we've got 34 museums here from around the world as well with cars here. And um, it's obviously quite difficult persuading a museum to send a car sometimes, but that's, that's got much easier. And as the event grows and becomes better known, people think it's a good thing for them to be seen here and that, that all helps. What are you most proud of then that you've managed to get here for this year's festival? Oh gosh, uh, there are some, uh, I mean BT52 BMW is pretty, pretty exceptional with the PK driving it, that car hasn't run you know, for years and years and years and that's been specially prepared uh, for this time. It's great to have some of the old favourites back, you know, there, there are big things we've had over the years, wonderful cars from Mercedes and you know, we had the W163 for the first time. And um, again this year the, the streamliner, the W196 streamliner Mercedes, that hasn't been seen since the 50s um, and we've been trying to get that car here since, you know, 94 or something so every year there are some new ones and also obviously especially this year we're celebrating 10 years we've got all the old you know the great our greatest hits if you like the bob riggles and the dragsters and the formula one cars and you know, all the great drivers the gurneys and the hills and the mosses and the 30s they're all here too and here is that streamliner mercedes now goodwood always specializes in bringing cars that haven't been seen in public for many years in some cases since they last raced this 1954 model was raced by Fangio and Moss. And the lucky guys who get to drive it this weekend are Jochen Mass and David Coulthard. Jochen, you're the lucky guy that gets to drive this streamliner mm. Mercedes-Benz. It really is a piece of automotive history. What's it like? It's fantastic, actually. It's really nice. I mean, I drove, uh, drove the 196 quite often. And now the Streamliner, you know, it's a two and a half liter engine. It's uh, more original, perhaps, than, uh, you know, the others. It's fantastic. Tell us a bit about the history of it. What did it mean to Mercedes-Benz, this car? Well, it meant a lot because at the time, don't forget, it was sort of a last-minute effort for the Grand Prix of Reims in France. And they got the cars ready in the last minute and they raced them there and they won. And that, of course, was part of this sort of upsurge in Mercedes racing. And that, of course, uh, enthused everybody within the company. And, uh, of course, it helped it a lot. So it, it really was one of the pivotal points, really, in, in, in race car building. You know, even so, it was not always appreciated as much on other circuits. But it was mainly built for high-speed circuits, so it's normal. And how big a deal was it for Mercedes to actually <coughs> get it out of the museum, fire it up and, and have it running here at Well, Goodwood? first, we didn't have one. We only had a very dilapidated one and so on, and nothing which ran. So this car was completely built up from scratch. They had to do the whole panel again. It was taken with, uh, you know, with computer points from whatever. And, you know, the most modern methods possible to make it really as authentic as possible, size-wise and all that. And um, it meant a lot because everybody always mused about the car and said, oh, the streamer, what a wonderful car, and it's pretty, of course. And um, to me, it's the most pretty race car of all times. It really is. I mean, I love other race cars too, but for some reason, that thing is just some aesthetic lines and it's very central, it's fantastic.
David, were you aware that you had a bit of motoring history in your hand? Yeah, absolutely. I've actually driven the, the Streamliner before. It was based on the 196, which I think was 1954 or something when the car first raced. And apparently it won championships back to back. So it's got a bit of history. Uh, extremely expensive, so it's taken it very steady. I noticed that, yeah. actually. And, uh, and also, you know, I feel a bit vulnerable in a car like that. You've got no seat belts, you've got no rollover bars. And when you get used to that sort of thing in a, in a modern Grand Prix car, um, it's a bit strange to be perched up there, you know, in the wind. Does it bear any relation whatsoever to the car that you drive? Yeah, it's, a, it's a racing car, so, you know, it's got characteristics like, you know, gearbox is uh, very precise, uh, engine obviously very throaty and uh, a lot of torque on, on that engine, but it's a much bigger, heavier car. So you wouldn't fancy racing it? If that, was, if that was what Formula One uh, is today, then of course we'd all be out there and we'd think it was normal. But uh, to, to be an event like this, which is a very enjoyable day out, to, to be amongst uh, like-minded motorsports enthusiasts, to see some great drivers from the past and some great vehicles uh, is, is more than enough for me. I'm quite happy with that. Join us after the break when I'll be talking to Jensen Button and rubbing shoulders with a few legends at the annual Goodwood Ball. dress up for the occasion. You look lovely, darling. Thank you. You keep coming back here. I get the feeling you really enjoy this event. I do. It's great fun. I mean, with the weather like this, where else would you want to be? What have you been doing this weekend? Uh, today I've been driving the uh, I drove an NSX, which was driven in Nürburgring, which is quite good fun, up the hill. And uh, tomorrow I'm driving the F1 car. Are you going to behave yourself in it? I might manage a few donuts. I have to wait and see. Have you making a big weekend of it? Yeah, I've got a few friends down here. I've got my um, my little uh, my time here. So uh, yeah, I am. I love it. It's just one of the weekends where I can watch watch amazing cars, and there's a lot of a lot of history here in, in uh, Formula One as well as bikes. Um, so it's it's a great weekend. We can just relax and, and, and do what we want. And does that side of it appeal to you? Because I know some racing drivers they just they like the here and now. They're not really massively into the past. Do you like it? Well, when I came into Formula One, I didn't really know much history about it, but. Uh, I've been here for the last four years now, and uh, meeting people like Sterling Moss and uh, people like that is just fantastic. You know, I've made some really good friends, and I don't see them very often, but um, it's great coming back and, and seeing them. It's like a reunion sort of thing. His lordship's out of drink. Can even look? They're all empty. Bad news. We're, we're all empty-handed. Look, we're lying <laughs> home. No more drink. We're going home. To talk to Lord Barton. Are you actually going to be able to hang out a bit and enjoy yourself tonight? Well, I don't know if I'm going to manage it. I think it finishes at two, doesn't it? Or three, yeah. but it trying to stay awake that long. But. Um, no, I'm looking forward to it. There's loads of people here and the weather's perfect. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. As long as you're going to join me this evening. See you later. In the morning sunshine, while some of us nursed our hangovers, it was time for the modern supercars to have their runs. This is the top of the current Lotus line, a nimble and very light Elise GT1. And a car so new it had never been seen in public before, the Bristol Fighter. The MG SV, the most powerful MG ever built from the reinvigorated MG Rover Group. And the latest Bentley Continental GT, driven with great aplomb by Derek Bell. The five times Le Mans winner is now a consultant to Bentley and played his own part behind the scenes in this year's 24 hours victory. One of several Ferraris in the supercar run, the 360M Challenge Stradale. Clearly, it's now officially cool to paint your Ferrari blue. A completely new shape by Italian master stylist Giorgetto Giugiaro. This is the Chevrolet Corvette Moray. And 
a more familiar Italian, the Maserati Spider. A very nice model for the supermodel, Jodie Kidd, herself a serious car enthusiast. Now this was a last minute surprise, first sight of the prototype of the new McLaren Mercedes road car, the SLR, which will soon be in production at McLaren's new Woking facility. Now let's look at some of the top drivers who opted for time runs to the top of the hill. This is David Franklin in Carlos Monteverdi's mighty Can-Am Ferrari 712 from 1969. It's the biggest, most powerful racing Ferrari ever built. David Franklin, a tremendously versatile historic racer. He races several cars from Carlos Monteverdi's huge collection and he's a very successful hill climber as well. But this is a great big car. He's on the grass at Mulcombe. It's a very wide car for a very narrow bumpy hill up to the flinty wall now, trying to keep clear of it. And now a big twitch as he puts 800 horsepower through the back wheels of the 712 Ferrari. But 42 seconds gone already through the slight left-hander along the straw bales, which takes him up to the finish line. He's over the finish line now. 48.7 seconds. Now, what can Rod Millen do about that in this huge animal of a car? The Toyota pickup twitching through the crossing game right over the grass, getting 900 horsepower through all four wheels, linked up to the tarmac. And now he goes twitching, under braking, almost losing track of the car before he turns it through the left hand of Vulcan, tramps on the bar. You see, he sits right in the middle of this extraordinary beast. And he's the one man who knows how to tame it, but it's always trying to get away from it. Gets the power on, grass and straw flying, lots of black smoke. You can hear the chirping of the turbochargers as he tramps over the throttle. It's 45 seconds dead. We had a little bit of a challenging week. We couldn't get the engine running right there until that last run. So, um, you know, very thanks to my, my, my team here. We put together a good car and I had a fabulous time as well. Now, here's a young man who really understands the science of hill climbing. It's Graham White Jr. from Scotland. He's the reigning British hill climb champion with this little Gould Cosworth GR51, a car purpose-built to go up a short, narrow tarmac hill as quickly as possible. Built three years ago, F1 sequential gearbox, a little Cosworth-built V6 engine, very light, a lot narrower than most of the other cars here today. It'll do zero to 100 miles an hour and back to zero again in 7.3 seconds. And look how neat and tidy Graham White is. He's always keeping the car in the middle of the road, He's not taking any risks at all. He almost looks slow, but he's not. 42.9 seconds over the line, and that has to be the fastest time run of the weekend. Sadly, that's the end of our coverage of the Goodwood Festival of Speed, but it's been wonderful showing you all these great cars, great drivers, great personalities. If you've enjoyed it as much as I have, be with us again in September when we'll be covering the Goodwood Revival meeting. In the meantime, enjoy your motorsport.